but we're not as tough. The one Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Rock Card Security. In our last lesson, we checked out protocols in services. And in this lesson, we're gonna check out how we can actually use individual cyber attacks against those services and protocols. It's gonna be a fun one, so stick around. I'm Brock from Rock Card Security, and let's get hacking. So once you're logged into the Junior Penetration Testing Try Hackney page, go ahead to Network Security and Protocols and Servers 2, the next lesson in our module. Protocols and servers room covered many protocols. We went over Telnet, HTTP, FTP, SMTP, POP3, and IMAP. Go ahead and click the blue start attack box button up there at the top, and then the green start machine button there in task one to get this thing rolling. Servers implementing these protocols are subject to different kinds of attacks. To name a few, we have sniffing attacks, man in the middle attacks, password attacks, and vulnerabilities. From a security perspective, think about what we aim to protect. Consider the security triad. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability, CIA. Confidentiality refers to keeping the contents of the communications accessible to the intended parties. Integrity is the idea of assuring any data sent is accurate, consistent, and complete upon reaching its destination. Finally, availability refers to being able to access the service when we need it. So confidentiality, making sure this is for your eyes only. Integrity, making sure that nothing was tampered with while that message was on its way here. And availability, making sure we can grab that data when we need to. Different parties will put varying emphasis on these three. For instance, confidentiality would be the highest priority for an intelligence agency. Online banking will put most emphasis on the integrity of transactions, making sure that no missing pennies were found. Availability is one of the highest importance for any platform making money by serving ads, making sure that when a customer clicks on that ad that the product is available to them to purchase. Knowing that we are protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, CIA, an attack aims to cause disclosure alternation and destruction, EAD, figure below shows us. These attacks directly affect the security of the system. For instance, network packet capture violates confidentiality and leads to the disclosure of information. A successful password attack can also lead to disclosure. On the other hand, a man in the middle attack or MITM attack breaks the system's integrity as it can alter the communicated data. We will focus on these three tasks in this room as these attacks are integral to the protocol design and server implementation. Vulnerabilities are of a broader spectrum and exploited vulnerabilities have different impacts on the target systems. For instance, exploiting a denial of service vulnerability can affect the system's availability, while exploiting remote code execution vulnerability can lead to more severe damages. It's important to note that a vulnerability by itself creates a risk damage can occur only when the vulnerability is exploited. We don't cover vulnerabilities in this room as they have their own module vulnerability research, but we do cover it in the junior pen testing learning path. So if you continue on this path, you will run into it. This room will focus on how a protocol can be upgraded or replaced to protect against disclosure and alteration, i.e. protecting the confidentiality and integrity of the transmitted device. We'll be recommending other modules that cover additional topics. Moreover, we introduce Hydra to find weak passwords. Once you have that attack box started and the virtual machine ready to go, you can proceed to tackle the following tasks, connect to the different services over Telnet or Netcat for better practice and learning experience. Click completed on that. All right, time to do a sniffing attack. Sniffing attack refers to using a network packet capture tool to collect information about the target. When a protocol communicates in clear text, the data can be captured by a third party to analyze. A simple network packet capture can reveal information such as the content of private messages and login credentials if the data isn't encrypted in transit. A sniffing attack can be conducted using an Ethernet 802.3 network card, provided that the user has proper permissions, root permissions on Linux and administrator privileges on Microsoft Windows. There are many programs available to capture network packets. We consider the following, TCP dump, free open source command line program that has been ported to work on many operating systems, Wireshark, also free open source graphical user interface or GUI, which is available for several operating systems, including Linux, Mac, and Windows. T-Shark is a command line interface alternative to Wireshark, so not as pretty, still can get the job done. There are several specialized tools for capturing passwords and even complete messages. However, this can still be achieved by TCP dump and Wireshark with some added effort. 
Consider a user checking his email messages using a pop three, which we learned about in the previous lesson. If you haven't checked out the previous lesson, go ahead and do that here. It'll kind of get you up to speed with what we're doing in today's lesson. First, we're going to use TCP dump to attempt to capture the username and password. In the terminal output below, we use the command sudo tcp dump port 110 capital A. Before explaining the command, we should mention that this attack requires access to the network traffic. For example, via a wiretap or switch with port mirroring. Alternatively, we can access the traffic exchanged if we launch a successful man in the middle attack. We need sudo as packet captures require root privileges. We wanted to limit the number of captured and displayed packets to those exchanged with the POP3 server. We know that POP3 uses port 110, so we filtered our packets using port 110. Finally, we wanted to display the contents of the captured packets in ASCII form, so we added dash capital A for ASCII. In the terminal output above, we have removed the unimportant packets to help you better focus on the ones that matter. In particular, the username and password are each sent in their own packet. The first packet explicitly displays user Frank, while the last packet reveals the password, pass D2XC9CGD. So that was TCP dump, the open source free command line interface. We could also use Wireshark to achieve the same results. In the Wireshark window below, we can see that we have entered pop in the filter field. Now that we filtered just the traffic we're interested in, we can see a username and password were captured. Once again, a little more easier to see, that's because of the graphical user interface. In brief, any protocol that uses clear text communication is susceptible to <laughs> this sniffing attack. The only requirement for this attack to succeed is to have access to a system between the two communicating systems. This attack requires attention. The mitigation lies in adding an encryption layer on top of any network protocol in particular, Transport Layer Security, TLS, has been added to HTTP, FTP, SMTP, POP3, IMAP, and many others. For remote access, Telnet has been replaced by the secure alternative, Secure Shell, or SSH. If you would like to learn more about Wireshark, we recommend the Wireshark 101 room. What do you need to add to the command sudo tcp dump to capture only Telnet traffic? Well, we need to remember what port Telnet runs on. And if you remember from the last lesson, that is going to be port 23. Whoop, whoop. You got it correct. What is the simplest display filter you can use with Wireshark to show only IMAP traffic? That would be IMAP. Just like we did previously with POP3, you're just gonna type in the name of the service, in this case, IMAP. A man in the middle, or MITM, attack occurs when a victim, A, believes they're communicating with a legitimate destination, and B, is unknowingly communicating with an attacker, E. In the figure below, we have the victim requesting the transfer of $20 to M. However, the attacker altered the message and replaced the original value with a new one. The legitimate destination, in this case the bank, received the modified message and acted upon it. The $20 was changed to $2,000 by the attacker, this attack is relatively simple to carry out if the two parties do not confirm the authenticity and integrity of each message. In some cases, the chosen protocol does not provide secure authentication or integrity checking. However, some protocols have inherent insecurities that make them susceptible to this kind of attack. Anytime you browse over HTTP, you are susceptible to man-in-the-middle attacks. And the scary thing is that you cannot recognize it. Many tools would aid you in carrying out such an attack, such as EdderCap, and better cap. A man in the middle attack can also affect other clear text protocols such as file transfer protocol, simple mail transfer protocol, and post office protocol 3. Mitigation against this attack requires the use of cryptography. The solution lies in proper authentication along with encryption or signing of the exchange messages. With the help of public key infrastructure, PKI, and trusted root certificates, transport layer security, TLS protects from man in the middle attacks. How many different interfaces does EdderCap offer? Well, if you click the hint button, they actually give you a link that you can go and check out. And this is about the EdderCap project. It shows the distributions and also the dependencies of this program. Now, for me, it was a little hard to uh, see this, but if you search for interfaces, you'll find it right here. EdderCap offers three interfaces, traditional command like GUI, and N-C-U-R-S-E-S. -E so that would be three interfaces. And how many ways can you invoke better cap? Okay, well, if we go to the hint, we have a usage page that we can go check out. Looks like better cap can be used in three different ways, web UI, interactive mode, and scripting. So we're going to say three, and that is correct. Good job, guys. Transport layer security. In this task, we learn about a standard solution to protect the confidentiality and integrity 
of the exchanged packet. The following approach can protect against password sniffing and man in the middle attacks. Secure Sockets Layer started when the World Wide Web started to see new applications, such as online shopping and sending payment information. Netscape introduced SSL in 1994, and with SSL 3.0 being released in 1996. But eventually, more security was needed, and TLS, Transport Layer Security Protocol, was introduced in 1999. Before we explain what TLS and SSL provide, let's see how they fit the networking model. The common protocols we have covered so far send the data in clear text. This makes it possible for anyone with access to the network to capture, save, and analyze the exchanged messages. The image below shows the ISO or OSI network layers. The protocols we have covered so far in this room are on the application layer. Considering the ISO OSI model, we can add encryption to our protocols via the presentation layer. Consequently, data will be presented in an encrypted format, ciphertext, instead of its original form. ISO OSI model is something that's going to be constantly brought up, usually in interviews or in your cyber study. So this is a good screenshot to take or maybe just scribble down some notes on it. There's actually whole videos just dedicated to explaining this topic, so I'm not going to go in depth, but it's a pretty useful and handy map to have. The ISO and OSI model shows pretty much how from an electrical source and packet is sent over the internet to someone else, kind of like the periodic table of the scientific world. It aims to group certain elements that have a lot in common so that we can distinguish where and how electricity and packets can travel. Because of the close relationship with secure sockets layer and transport layer security, one might be used instead of the other. However, TLS is more secure than secure sockets layer, and it has practically replaced SSL. We could have dropped SSL and just written TLS instead of SSL slash TLS, but we will continue to mention the two to avoid any ambiguity because the term SSL is still in wide use. However, at the time of this lesson, we can expect all modern servers to be using TLS, transport layer security. An existing clear text protocol can be upgraded to use encryption via SSL slash TLS. We can use TLS to upgrade HTTP, FTP, SMTP, POP3, and IMAP to name a few. The following table lists the protocols we have covered and their default ports before and after the encryption via SSL and transport layer security. This list is not exhaustive, however, the purpose is to help us better understand the process. Considering the case of HTTP, initially to retrieve a web page over HTTP, the web browser would need at least perform the following two steps. Number one, establish a TCP connection with the remote web server. And number two, send HTTP requests to the web server, such as GET and POST requests. Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, or HTTPS, requires an additional step to encrypt the traffic. The new step takes place after establishing a transmission control protocol connection and before sending HTTP requests. This extra step, can be inferred from the ISO OSI model in the image presented earlier. Consequently, HTTPS requires at least the following three steps. Establishing a transmission control protocol connection, establishing a secure sockets layer, transport layer security connection, and sending HTTP requests to the web server, hypertext transfer protocol, not secure. To establish an SSL TLS connection, the client needs to perform the proper handshake with the server based on RFC 6101. The SSL connection established will look like the figure below. RFC 6101 is this SSL protocol version 3.0 document created by the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. And if you want to learn more about the Internet Engineering Task Force, I recommend you check out my video here. It's a pretty cool video where I use the Wi-Fi Pineapple Nano and discuss the history of wireless protocols, all while exploring Jacksonville, Wyoming. So if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. After establishing that transmission control protocol connection with the server, the client establishes a secure sockets layer transport layer security connection as shown in the figure above. The terms might look complicated depending on your knowledge of cryptography, but we can simplify the four steps as, number one, the client sends a client hello to the server to indicate its capabilities such as supported algorithms. Number two, the server responds with the server hello, indicating the selected connection parameters. The server provides its certificate if server authentication is required. The certificate is a digital file to identify itself. It is usually digitally signed by a third party. Moreover, it might send additional information necessary to generate the master key and its server key exchange message before sending the server hello done message to indicate that it is done with the negotiation. Number three, the client responds with a client key exchange which contains additional information required 
to generate the master key. Furthermore, it switches to use encryption and informs the server using the change cipher spec message. Number four, the server switches to use encryption as well and informs the client on the change cipher spec message. If this still sounds sophisticated, don't worry. We only need the gist of it. A client was able to agree on a secret key with a server that has a public certificate. This secret key was securely generated so that a third party monitoring the channel wouldn't be able to discover it. Further communication between the client and the server will be encrypted using the generated key. Consequently, once a secure sockets layer transport layer security handshake has been established, HTTP hypertext transfer protocol requests and exchange data won't be accessible to anyone watching the communication channel. As a final note, for SSL TLS to be effective, especially when browsing the web over HTTPS, we rely on public certificates signed by certificate authorities trusted by our systems. In other words, when we browse to try hack me over HTTPS, our browser expects the Try Hack Me web server to provide a signed certificate from a trusted certificate authority as per the example below. This way our browser ensures that it is communicating with the correct server and a man in the middle attack cannot occur, most likely. In the figure above, we can see the following information. Number one, to whom is the certificate issued? That is the name of the company that will use this certificate. Number two, who issued the certificate? This is the certificate authority that issued this certificate. And number three, validity period. For instance, you don't want a certificate that is expired. 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 Luckily, we don't have to check the certificate manually for every site we visit. Our web browser will do it for us. Our web browser will ensure that we are talking with the correct server and ensure that our communication is secure thanks to the server's certificate. DNS can also be secured using transport layer security. What is the three letter acronym of the domain name system protocol that uses transport layer security? Now, this requires research so we can go out and explore the internet and we can say DNS protocol that uses TLS. DNS over TLS or DOT. Now that's a good way to remember domain name system over transport layer security or DNS over TLS, DOT, dot. All right, there we go. Secure Shell or SSH was created to provide a secure way for remote system administration. In other words, it lets you securely connect to another system over the network and execute commands on the remote system. Put simply in the S and SSH stands for secure, which can be summarized simply as follows. Number one, you can confirm the identity of the remote server. Number two, exchange messages are encrypted and can only be decrypted by the intended recipient. And number three, both sides can detect any modification in the messages. The above three points are ensured by cryptography. In more technical terms, they are part of confidentiality and integrity, made possible through the proper use of different encryption algorithms. To use SSH, you need an SSH server and an SSH client. The SSH server listens on port 22 by default. The SSH client can authenticate using a username and a password a private and public key after the SSH server is configured to recognize the corresponding public key. On Linux, Mac OS, and Microsoft Windows builds after 2018, you can connect to an SSH server using the following command, SSH, the username, at, and then the IP address. Pretty straightforward. This command will try to connect to the server of the IP address of the attack machine with the login name, username. If an SSH server is listening on the default port, it will ask you to provide the password for username, once authenticated, the user will have access to the target server's terminal. The terminal output below is an example of using SSH to access a Debian Linux server. So here they're logging in, simple command, SSH, secure shell, and then we have the username, and then we have the IP address. It's listening on that default port of SSH, port of 22. So we do in fact get a message here, and it looks like we are logged in with the timestamp. In the example above, we issue the command SSH mark at the IP address of the attack machine. Then once we entered the correct password, we got access to the remote systems terminal. SSH is very reliable for remote administration because our username and password were sent encrypted. Moreover, all commands we execute on the remote system will be sent over an encrypted channel. Note that if this is the first time to connect to the system, we will need to confirm the fingerprint of the SSH server's public key to avoid man in the middle attacks. As explained earlier, man in the middle attacks take place when a malicious party E situates itself between A and B and communicates with A pretending to be B and communicates with B pretending to be A. Well, 
A and B think they are communicating directly with each other. In the case of SSH, we don't usually have a third party to check if the public key is valid, so we need to do this manually. We can use Secure Shell to transfer files between SCP or Secure Copy Protocol based on the SSH protocol. An example of the syntax is as follows. We have SCP, Secure Copy Protocol. We have the username. We have at the IP address. And then we have colon, forward slash, the directory home, forward slash mark, forward slash archive, and then the extension of the file, .tar.gunzip, and a tilde, the root of the home directory of the current logged in user. This command will copy a file named archive.tar.gunzip from the remote system located in the slash home slash mark directory to the root of the home directory of the current logged in user, i.e. the tilde. So we have another example syntax, SCP secure copy protocol. We have the file that we're gonna be copying and then we have the username at the IP address and then we have the directory of where that file is going to be copied. The command will copy the file backup.tar.bz2 from the local system to the directory slash home slash mark slash on the remote system. As a closing note, a file transfer protocol could be secured using secure sockets layer slash transmission layer security by using the FTPS, file transfer protocol secure protocol which uses port 990-990. It's worth mentioning that FTP can also be secured using the SSH protocol, which is the SFTP protocol. By default, this service listens on port 22, just like SSH. Use SSH to connect to the IP address as mark with the password, which they give. Using uname-r, find the kernel release. First things first, we will open up a new terminal. We're gonna do SSH and then space. And then what do we put? We put the username, that is right, mark, and then what do we put next? We put at the IP address of the machine we're going to connect to. In this case, 10.10.64.246. Make sure you're putting in the updated IP address. Then all we need to do is press enter and it will ask us if we want to continue connecting. We'll say yes. And we'll go ahead and put in the password for Mark. Uppercase XB, lowercase TC, the number 49, uppercase AB and press enter and we're in. Okay, now all we need to do is a simple uname dash R and that will provide us with the kernel release. Looks like it is 5.4.0-84-generic. That is correct. Use SSH to download the file book.txt from the remote system. How many KBs or kilobytes did SCP display as download size? So once we're logged into his account, we can actually run an LS and that will show us the different files available on Mark's home directory. Looks like we have a mail directory, document.txt and book.txt. That's the one we're looking for. So if we print our working directory with PWD, we'll see we're in slash home slash Mark. That is the directory we'll use when we're using secure copy protocol. So we'll go ahead and exit out of that connection and then we'll issue a new command, SCP secure copy protocol, the username at the IP address. Yours may be different than mine, make sure you're using the updated IP address. And then we're going to do colon slash home slash mark, and then slash the name of the file book.txt, and then space, where we're gonna put it? We're gonna put it right in our home directory with the tilde or squiggly line. We'll press enter. And then we'll issue the password, grab that real quick. Capital X, capital B, little t, little c, 49, capital AB. And we'll press enter. And it looks like it was downloaded successfully. Woohoo! Okay, now it should be in our home directory. So all we have to do is ls. It looks like it is right there. Now we could go ahead and cat or less into that file to take a look. But the question is how many kilobytes did secure copy protocol display as the download size? In this case, the download size was 415 kilobytes, 105.2 megabytes per second. So we'll go ahead and put 415, and that is correct. We discussed network packet captures and man in the middle attacks, as well as how these attacks can be mitigated using TLS and SSH. The third type of attack that we will cover in this room is a password attack. Many protocols require you to authenticate. Authentication is proving who you claim to be. When we are using protocols such as Post Office Protocol 3, we should not be given access to the mailbox before verifying our identity. The POP3 example from the protocols and servers room is repeated below for your convenience. In this example, we are identified as the user Frank and the server authenticated us because we provided the correct password. In other words, the password is one way to authentication. Authentication or proving your identity can be achieved through one of the following or a combination of two. Something you know, such as a password and PIN code. Number two, something you have, such as a SIM card, RFID card, and USB dongle. Or number three, something you are, such as a fingerprint, 
and iris. This task will focus on attacks against passwords, i.e. something the target knows. If you revisit the communication with several previous servers using protocols such as Telnet, POP3, and IMAP, we always need a password to gain access. Based on the 150 million usernames and passwords leaked from the Adobe breach in 2013, the top 10 passwords are 1234561234567289, password, Adobe123, 1234567289, QWERTY, oh, that's a favorite one because of the keyboard layout, 1234567, 11111 Photoshop 123123. One, two, three. Only two passwords are related to Adobe and its products, but the rest are generic. You might think that this has changed over the past decade. However, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 are still common choices for many users. Others haven't realized yet that QWERTY is not secret and is used by many as their password. Attacks against passwords are usually carried out by password guessing. Guessing a password requires some knowledge of the target, such as their pet's name and birth year. This is often information you can find on Facebook or some other social media site. Number two, a dictionary attack. This approach expands on password guessing and attempts to include all valid words in the dictionary or word list. And number three, brute force attack. This attack is the most exhaustive and time consuming where an attacker can go as far as trying all possible character accommodations, which grows fast and exponential growth with the number of characters. Let's focus on dictionary attacks. Over time, hackers have compiled list after list containing leaked passwords from data breaches. One example is RocketU's list of breached passwords, which you can find on the attack box at user share word list, rocku.txt. The choice of the word list should depend on your knowledge of the target. For instance, a French user might use a French word instead of an English one. Consequently, a French word list might be more promising. We want an automated way to try the common passwords or the entries from a word list. Here comes THC Hydra. Hey, Hydra. Hydra supports many protocols, including FTP, POP3, IMAP, SMTP, SSH, and all methods related to hypertext transfer protocol. The general command line syntax is Hydra-L, the username dash P, capital P, wordlist.txt, and then the name of the server, the name of the service, where we specify the following options. Dash L should precede the username, i.e. the login name of the target. Dash P goes before wordlist.txt, which is the text file containing a list of passwords that you want to try with the provided username. Server is the host name or IP address of the target server. Just like we're using Telnet, SSH, SCP, that's also going to be the IP address for this means of attacking. Service indicates the service which you are trying to launch the dictionary attack. You can use different services depending on the route that you are using for this password attack. Considering the following concrete examples, hydra-l mark, which is the username, dash p, and then we have our word list rocku.txt where it's located. We have the IP address of the server, the target machine, and we're going to use the service FTP file transfer protocol. This command is a different version of the previous command. It's identical. It's just using FTP colon slash slash then the IP address. So it's a little more bunched together. We also have this version of the Hydra command using the username Frank with the same word list, except it is going to be using the service SSH as can be seen as the end part of the command there. There are some extra optional arguments that you can add dash S port to specify a non-default port for the service in question. You just type the number of the port there instead of doing like SSH or FTP. You could actually type in whatever port you wanted, like 9090, whatever you prefer. Dash capital V or dash V capital V for verbose makes Hydra show the username and password combinations that are being tried. This verbosity is very convenient to see the progress, especially if you're still not confident of your command line syntax. Dash TN, where N is the number of parallel connections to the target, dash T16 will create 16 threads to use to connect to the target. Dash D for debugging to get more detailed information of what's going on. The debugging output can save you much frustration. For instance, if Hydra tries to connect to a closed port and timing out, dash D will reveal this right away. Once the password is found, 
you can issue Control C to end the process. In Try Hack Me Task, we expect any attack to finish within less than five minutes. However, the attack would usually take longer in real life scenarios. Some can take days or months depending on the processing power of your computer. Options for verbosity or debugging can be pretty helpful if you want Hydra to update you about its progress. In summary, attacks against login systems can be carried out efficiently using a tool such as THC Hydra combined with a suitable word list. Mitigation against such attacks can be sophisticated and depends on the target system. A few of the approaches include password policies, enforce minimum complexity constraints on the passwords set by the user, account lockout, locks the account after a certain number of failed attempts, throttling authentication attempts, delays the response to a login attempt, a couple of seconds of delay is tolerable for someone who knows the password, but they can severely hinder automated tools. Using CAPTCHA requires solving a question difficult for machines. You've probably run into this if you're trying to spin the animal in the right rotation or answer how many buses or bicycles are in a certain picture or squares. It may be a little annoying, but it works well if the login page is via a graphical user interface or GUI like in a web browser. Note that CAPTCHA stands for Completely Automated Public Turing Test, which tells computers and humans apart. Requiring the use of a public certificate for authentication. For instance, this approach works well for Secure Shell. Two-factor authentication asks the user to provide a code via other means, whether that's email, smartphone app, or short message service. There are many other approaches that are more sophisticated or might require some established knowledge about the user, such as IP-based geolocation. Using a combination of the above approaches is an excellent approach to protect against password attacks. We learned that one of the email accounts is lazy, spelled L-A-Z-I-E. What is the password used to access the IMAP service on the IP address of the attack machine? 10.10.64.246 in my case. Make sure you've got yours all ready to go. Well, first things first, we're gonna make sure that we actually have a word list that we can work with. So we'll go ahead and do ls slash user slash share slash wordless and then press enter and it looks like we have a couple of wordless here notable among them is rocku.txt so we will go ahead and use that one if you want to check it out you can let's do a cat slash user slash share slash wordless slash rocku.txt and you can see all the passwords that have accumulated from this rocku text it goes on for quite a while so we'll just cancel that we are going to use a built-in tool which is in the virtual machine and most kali linux operating system called hydra it is a password cracking tool and we're going to do hydra space dash l indicating it's a username then we're going to put the username l-a-z-i-e lazy then a space dash p for our word list and then we'll give the location of the rock u word list slash user slash share slash word list slash rockyou.txt. Then we'll grab that IP address, which should be at the bottom of task seven in your question, which is your attack machine's IP 246. In my case, it's 10.10.64.246. Make sure you have the updated one. And then the last thing we're going to do is a space with the service. In this case, they ask, what is used to access the IMAP service on this specific IP address? So we'll do IMAP. If you remember, there's a bunch of built-in protocols into Hydra when we're using the command, such as file transfer protocol, secure shell. So we're gonna see if IMAP is also included in there. We'll press enter. And it looks like it is working. Looks like the data is starting to begin its attack against that IP address. We have the password butterfly. Looks like it was try 143, that was successful. One valid password and we've got it. Good job guys, you just carried out your first password attack, congratulations. We're gonna put in that password right here, butterfly, and that is correct. Okay guys, we went over a lot. We went over sniffing attacks, man in the middle attacks, password attacks, breach attack, we found out how to mitigate them. Many other attacks can be conducted against specific servers and protocols. They also provide a list against specific server protocol attacks. We have among them vulnerability research, Metasploit and Burp Suite. We'll go over vulnerability research and Metasploit in the junior pen and testing learning path. We actually have already gone over Burp Suite. So if you haven't done those lessons, go ahead and check that out here. It's a nice little group of modules that you will want to check out because it's a pretty cool tool. Burp Suite, it can intercept HTTP traffic and actually perform some pretty interesting attacks. So check that out if you haven't. 
It's good to remember the default port number for common and protocols for convenience and services we covered are listed in the following table sorted by alphabetical order. This is a pretty cool table that they provide. Lots of services here. You can add that to your collection. They also have a nice little table here summarizing the different options for Hydra, the password attacking tool. All right, guys, you finished eight rooms of the network security module. Good job, and I will see you in the last room of network security, the network security challenge. I'm Brock from Brock Card Security. Keep hustling and take care. <laughs>